Welcome to Westminster Online. I'm Chris Ward, one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Thanks for taking time in your day to press into God's Word uh, and to join us as we do that together. Uh, we are finishing our Book of Ruth study today, um, the last couple of verses of this amazing short little story. I, I pray that through this, the last couple of weeks, you've found this uh, short Old Testament book as uh, exciting and uh, interesting as I have, as I've been working my way through this book again. I mean, I've done it before, obviously, but, but this time has really just brought up some new depths uh, to this little story. Uh, this, this story, actually, Ruth has often uh, talked about as being one of the most intertextual books within all of Scripture, meaning that line by line, it has more connections with the other books in the Bible than just about any other book. Uh, and that's Old and New Testament both. I pray also, though, that you will find that connection in your own life and your own heart, as we see that the ordinary choices that are made by ordinary people in ordinary time can be used by God to bring grace and redemption and transformation and hope into the lives of the people around us, and that God can use the small acts that we make in, in his name to ripple uh, into great works of healing and redemption. Well, we are on this journey of faith together, and um, we need to be able to lean on one another. So however we can support you in that journey, let us know. And let's just start by going to God's word together. But let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, being a God of redemption, a God who sees our lives, knows us by name, and Lord, comes to walk with us. I pray that you would be present with us today, that we would feel your presence and hear your voice speaking to us. And we pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a look at this last section in the book of Ruth. Well, as we wrap up this uh, short story of the book of Ruth, uh, I just want to remind us that this story did not start in a great place. I mean, it's going to have the happy ending, and we're always happy with this book to, to have that happily ever after. But it didn't start in a good place. Uh, in fact, that, that suffering is a big part of the theme of this book. Uh, remember, we started way back in chapter one with Elimelech uh, and his wife Naomi and their sons Mahlon and Chilion in the middle of a famine deciding to move to Moab, which was, uh, again, a, a kind of traditional enemy of Israel. And then remember that Elimelech and the sons died there, leaving Naomi alone and without any means, aside from her daughter-in-law, Ruth, who decided to stick with her. This is the first of several or many, actually, righteous choices we see in this little book. And it's these choices, little interesting choices, one after another, choices that are made kind of in the image of God, in the character of God, where people choose to act uh, embody truly God's character in contrast to their normal culture. Remember the, the end of the book of Judges that, that precedes this book said, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Except in this book we see ordinary people like Ruth and Boaz and Naomi acting with God's character in their heart in, and in their sight, and, and God using those actions to redeem those people and their community and their nation and even the world. So that's what we're looking at today. Let's jump right into the text. Ruth chapter 4, we're going to start at verse 13 and work through to the end. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. So right away, we're looking at a shift in the life of Ruth in a big way, right? There's been actually a radical identity shift. This isn't just a romance story. This is a transformation story, right? So in, in, you might remember back in chapter 2, verse 10, Ruth saw herself uh, as, well, in the, in the Hebrew word was a nochria. I am a foreigner, she said. That's my identity. I'm a foreigner. I don't belong. In chapter 2, verse 13, she responds to Boaz's generosity with surprise and saying, why are you, you know, being gracious to me when I'm a shifa? I am lower than your servants. By th chapter 3, verse 9, though, she acknowledges that she's now an ama, 
I am your servant. So there's kind of a move upward. And now finally in chapter four, what is she? She's an Isha, a wife. Beloved, belonging, protected. She has a home, she has a name, she has an inheritance. Culminating when, as we read, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Important phrase there, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. This, this story says that it's not just regular biology happening here. Remember, after 10 years of, of marriage with Mahlan, she had still had not uh, had a child, uh, right? So after 10 years of barrenness, the Lord gave her conception through divine intervention. And although that divine intervention has been a part of this story all along here, Finally, in chapter 4, it's explicitly mentioned, God is acting. The Lord himself has been active, and now he acts to bring a son. Verse 14, then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. All right, so let's talk about the story of Ruth and the redemption of Naomi, that Naomi is being redeemed. Re remember the beginning of the story and, and what Naomi looked like when she returned to Bethlehem at the end of chapter one. Remember what the women had said to her then. Is this Naomi? Right, what happened to her? And, and do you remember Naomi's response at the time? Don't even call me Naomi. Call me bitter, because that's what I am, right? For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. The Almighty has brought calamity upon me. You see, she's so angry, and she's so hurt, and she's so lost, and with reason. She, her life has, has fallen to pieces. She's deep in the pit, and believing that God himself was against her. I mean, do you know anyone like that in your world? Do you ever feel like that yourself? that God must be against you because just the, the hits just keep coming. Well, what does it mean in, in that kind of a situation to be able to have a perspective shift, to know that you're not forsaken and you're not alone, that God has not forsaken them? Who can stand with people in the midst of their mess in their darkest moments and see that God is still with them? And, and, and how does that make a difference? And, and I, by the way, I do not mean by trying to give people like pat answers like, don't worry, God's with you. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the midst of the pain, having someone there with you. You know, you know this story, the book of Ruth, is sometimes compared to the book of Job, only from a female, female perspective, right? Both in the book of Job and, and here, Naomi, they lose everything and become destitute and pariahs because of their loss. It's just so much pain in both of these books. In Job's case, his friends came alongside of him to sit with him in his pain for a time. They do okay for like a verse or two, but eventually they just can't keep their mouths shut and they start to give him all of the theological reasonings and their answers for why he's going through what he's going through. And it's just not helpful. And we need to know when somebody's suffering, it's not helpful for us to go in and try to explain their suffering. You know, it's like Job's friends wanted to talk about Job with Job instead of being with him in the midst of the mess. They just couldn't handle it. On the other hand, in the book of Ruth, Ruth says to Naomi, I will walk this road with you no matter where it leads. You remember back to chapter one, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. And, and, and she proves it. She proves that, as we've talked about, this chesed love, this stubborn, faithful love, I'm just here with you. And she also proves it by providing tangible help along the way. You know, to go out and glean and take care of their needs. She's, she's meeting Naomi's needs in the midst of Naomi's pain. And that makes a difference. You know, in both the stories of Job and Naomi, God was still active. But Ruth actually helps Naomi to see that by being the embodiment of God's action. While in Job's case, he actually will have to have a conversation with later, uh, later on with God at the end of his book because his friends dropped the ball. They didn't in any way embody God's grace or love or presence. They were just, you know, theologizing. Ruth embodies love. 
And the book of Ruth shows us that even as Naomi's story was progressing, even in the midst of her darkness, even in her hurt and bitterness when she felt forgotten or even judged, God was still there. And God was active and God was for her. And we can see that in Ruth herself. This is what the community is now celebrating. The Lord has not left you without a redeemer. But you know, it's, it's hard to feel that when you're in the midst of the pain, when, when we feel like we're drowning and life is sucking us down into this dark abyss. And, and do you ever feel that way, that you're just getting pulled down? You know, along the coast of the Italian Riviera, there in this, sm there's this little small cove where you can find the Abbey of San Fruttuoso di Camoli. And it's the location of an interesting statue, Il Cristo degli Abissi. It's an eight foot tall bronze statue of Jesus, head and arms raised upward towards heaven in, in a benediction of peace. Well, that itself is not all that interesting. That, there's lots of statues of Jesus with his arms raised, right? What's unique about this particular statue is that it, is, it isn't located inside the walls of the abbey, but actually out in the middle of the bay. 17 meters, that's 56 feet for us stubborn non-metric Americans, below the surface. While that's relatively shallow for a scuba dive, it's more than twice as deep as the average swimmer is willing to go. Five times as deep as the average deep end of the pool. The sculpture, the, the Christ of the Abyss, was put there as a memorial and has since been copied several other times in other places. For example, there's one in Granada, there's another in Key Largo, Florida. But the idea is that when, when we feel like we're drowning, when the waters are sweeping over us and the light is fading, God is actually still there with us. In fact, from that position of peril, we can actually look down and find that Christ is there in the depths, giving his blessing of peace upon us, there to catch us in his arms if need be. Incidentally, uh, that piece, uh, we're, we're going to actually be starting a new series next week on the word shalom, that Hebrew word for peace and more than peace. So I hope you'll come back and, and study that with us as well. You know, one passage about this kind of feeling of Christ meeting us there in the midst of it, of God holding us in the midst of the, of the storm and the, and, the, and the sinking feeling, uh, and this passage that I've actually clung, clung to for many years, it's, it's brought me great help and hope in the midst of many crises, is Isaiah 43, where the Lord says, Fear not, for I am with you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Where is God when we feel like we are in the depths? when we feel like the waters have swept over us and, and we are alone in the dark and being sucked down into the abyss, he's right there. Our God is still working and still invested in his love for us, still bringing redemption. You know, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition alone is, uh, among all of the religions, are, are religions that actually honor our suffering and say that our God is willing to enter into it with us. He's right there, beneath us even, to hold us up. Another great passage on this is Psalm 139. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. you know, God honors our suffering and walks with us in it and grows us through it even. You know, as the book of Ruth progresses, Naomi can begin to see these truths. This is part of the redemption of Naomi, how things have been shifting. 
You know, Ruth's faithfulness, Boaz's generosity, what we see in chapter 2, that snapped her out of this feeling of depression and lostness and, and into a mindset of hope. And that hope just continues to grow and transform her. And, and you know, hope is one of the, the most transformative mental superpowers that we have as human beings. But here's the interesting thing about hope, though. Hope is actually built upon remembering It's remembering good things or feelings or experiences from the past and then anticipating that possibility in the future or that guarantee in the future. It's remembering the light when you're lost in the darkness and believing that the light can come again. That means in order for us to really have hope, we actually have to have experienced something good. And for people who had a lot of brokenness, we might need to be the ones who embody that goodness in their life in little ways to begin sparking that idea of hope. Now, where does Naomi gain her hope from? Well, she gains hope as she experiences God's presence and goodness embodied in Ruth first and then in Boaz as they both live out the character of God, the the chesed love of God in her presence. It's then that she can start to see the possibilities for what may yet come, that the Lord is still at work, that that there's good yet to be revealed, and, and that hope is made tangible in the Lord addressing the hurts that she had lived through. Now coming to conclusion as we wrap up our story. Remember her complaint in chapter one? Well, it's now being answered in chapter four. She's not empty any longer. God is not against her as she had feared. She has not been left without a redeemer. Now, who's the redeemer that the women are actually talking about? Boaz, right? Actually, no. Boaz was the redeemer at the beginning of the chapter, absolutely. And obviously, he's been God's redeemer, the Goel in this place. But they're not talking about Boaz anymore. The women go on to name the redeemer. Verse 15. He, the Redeemer, shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Huh. Who's the Redeemer now? The Redeemer is the Son. In fact, actually, that's a pretty important phrase. Let's say that together because it's going to become really important as this story continues to ripple through time. Who is the Redeemer? The Redeemer is the Son. You know, the women go on to celebrate Naomi's redemption, this breaking in of a joy that she thought was lost to her. You know, this doesn't by any way, uh, by any means, uh, erase the hurt or wounds that she has lived uh, through. But on the other side of that suffering is new life and a story that continues to flow onward. She bears her wounds forward, but she's able to go forward, covered in God's grace. You know, her suffering was real, but on the other side of suffering is new life. It's redemption. The Redeemer is the Son. And we're going to come back to that. And how did God get, uh, shift Naomi's story? Well, one of the main ways that God shifted her story was through Ruth, who, as the community now says, is worth more to her than seven sons. She is the embodiment of God's chesed love, this stubborn, faithful, never-ending, undeserved, but, but freely given love. And that means that Ruth is a window through which God's own heart shines into the lives of the people around her, especially Naomi. And the community recognizes Ruth's change in identity as well. Remember that when she first showed up in Bethlehem, when they would refer to her, she was Ruth the Moabite. Now she's Ruth, your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is worth more than seven sons. Her identity has shifted in their eyes as well. It is Ruth that has been given, that has given birth to Naomi's redeemer. Ruth, who's now part of their community. You know, on a practical level, this redemption means that Naomi is now reconnected to the resources of the community through her male heir. But, you know, it's so much deeper than that as well as we'll get to in a little while. In a little while. Verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. 
And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. You know, it's interesting that the community names the son and not Ruth and Boaz or, or not even Naomi. I don't know, maybe, maybe they didn't want a repeat of uh, Mahlon and Chilion, which mean respectively sickness or weak and wasting away. Obed, on the other hand, means worshiper. A little bit better trajectory for this new son. And also an indication that the community around Boaz and Ruth and Naomi recognize the presence and, and activity of God in this story. They see that God has been tangibly at work and so it's embodied in the name of, of the son, the worshiper. A son has been born to Naomi. Interesting little uh, work there as well, right? This is, this is definitely a different kind of culture than ours. And, and if you remember, Lori talked about this last week, and I think I mentioned it the week before, about leveret marriage, where, where um, you, you marry the widow in order to continue the line of the dead husband or the name of the dead husband, which means that Ruth and Boaz, when they give birth to this son, are willing themselves to step back into the shadows so that Naomi's hope can continue and Elimelech's name won't be for forgotten from the people. They are willing, in fact, to disappear and we're going to come back to this in a moment. But, but first, why doesn't the story just stop here? I mean, there's a son, and, and that's kind of the hope that, w that, that they were longing for. Instead, though, it goes on to detail the legacy of the son, that it continues to ripple forward, right? Obed is the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. And that's because this story isn't just about redeeming Ruth or redeeming Naomi. It's also a story about redeeming Israel. Now remember back to the beginning of the series when we were talking about the, the problem that was facing the, the people in this particular time in history. I mentioned actually at the beginning of our, our, uh, our uh, sermon today, uh, Judges 21-25, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So there's two problems. There's no king and everyone's going crazy. But the story of Ruth actually answers both of those problems distinctly. First, not everyone is doing what is right only in their own eyes, because we see that some people choose to live by what is right in God's eyes. We see them here within this story, embodying God's character, right? When they do, when Boaz acts in righteousness, when Ruth acts in courage, it leads them to this family line being continued, which then leads not to just any king in Israel, but to the first and best king, David. I mean, obviously Saul was a king before David, but David was the, the one who really got it, who finally united Israel as a single nation, a single people. Of course, when you actually look at the life of David, it's not actually so, so great, and so we, we hope that he's not the final answer, right? And he's not, because we're going to see that in a little while. But for now, David is a step in the right direction. And this story makes sure to point that out, that God is doing something not just to redeem these lives, but because these lives are willing and the redemption happens there, it ripples out to the entire nation. That ordinary people make ordinary decisions in ordinary time that echo God's heart and his character and it leads to the redemption of Israel itself. And then as if to hammer that point home, we end with this lovely little short story. We end it with a genealogy of all things. So verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Just a great way to end a lovely little story, isn't it, with a genealogy. Well, actually, let's talk about family heritage for a moment and the redeeming of Boaz in this story. <clears throat> 
So we've already mentioned that Boaz's father, Salmon, had married Rahab, the, the foreigner and prostitute who had lived in the city of Jericho and, and become notable in his, Israel's history for her part in helping the people gain entrance into the promised land. So Boaz is already notable because of who his mother is and, and his father. What about Salmon's father, Nashon? You, you guys know who Nashon is? Well, we probably should. He was actually pretty notable himself. You can find out more about him if you look back in the book of Numbers. You'll find that he was actually the chief of the tribe of Judah. He was the, the head of the tribe of Judah. And you know, when the people marched through the wilderness, you know which tribe led them? The first tribe to set out? It was Judah. And who was the leader of Judah? Well, it's Nashon, the son of Amminadab, number three behind Moses and Aaron in importance within the men of Israel. Oh, by the way, Nashon's sister, uh, Elisheba, uh, this would have been Boaz's great aunt, married none other than Aaron, the great high priest and brother of Moses. So obviously, this is quite a lineage that leads up to Boaz. And yet note this, that Boaz is willing to step back in the shadows to let Elimelech's name go forward through this process of leveret marriage. He's willing to let his own name be forgotten for the sake of someone else. So last week, we were introduced to another character briefly, that, that guy who in Hebrew was called the Ploni Almoni. You know, Boaz said, hey, Ploni Almoni, come on over here. I want to talk to you. You remember that guy? The, the, the one who, who was, had more of a right to be the Goel, the Redeemer, than Boaz did, who, who could have claimed this. What, what was that guy's name again? Do you, you remember? Does anybody know? You know, if you remember the story from last week, he was more than willing to buy the land, but he backed out when he found out that Ruth was attached to it. And he had a reason for that. What was his worry? What was his reason for not redeeming Ruth? He says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. In other words, I don't want my own name to be forgotten, so I can't redeem it. You redeem it. Now just think about that for a minute. What, what do we see at the end of this story of the book of Ruth? Well, in this genealogy, what do we see? You know, the one who wanted to save his own name to not be forgotten... We don't know who he is. We can't say. He's the Poloni Almoni, that so-and-so, Mr. No-Name. But the ones, Ruth and Boaz, who are willing to sacrifice their own fame, their own name, their own inheritance for the sake of Naomi and Elimelech's legacy, well, they're actually remembered and celebrated. In fact, not just here in this, in this um, final genealogy at the end of, book of uh, the book of Ruth, but if you'd like to turn with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, the beginning of the New Testament, verse 3. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and what a mess this whole story is. You look at a lot of these people, especially when these women show up that something was not going right, but those women are, are held up as being righteous and keeping the story going forward. Anyway, skip through all of that, skip through all these kings, some of them were fairly good, and some of them absolutely broken train wrecks, until you finally arrive at, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. And of course, we know of that story, right? The Christmas story. We know in that story that the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. And that that son is our Redeemer. That we see ordinary people making ordinary choices in alignment with God's will and character and becoming extraordinary extensions of God's grace as God's redemption ripples from person to person to person. And as Naomi is redeemed and as Ruth is redeemed and even as Boaz is redeemed, God's whole story is being redeemed and through it, well, you and me, 
invited into this story to become a part of the family. That, that same son, you know, God gave Mary conception and she bore a son and that son became our redeemer. And that son, that redeemer, just like Boaz and Ruth, was willing to give up his own inheritance, his own name, his own life, that we could be brought into the family. He laid it all down. He became a servant, as Philippians 2 reminds us. Born as a slave, taking the lowest form, and even to give his life for us on the cross. And then, of course, Philippians goes on to say, so that now his name is higher than any other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee on, in heaven and on earth and under the earth should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Now, this story of Ruth ends, but it doesn't end. It just keeps rippling. It ripples forward into the very coming of the Christ, and that ripples into your life and into mine. And as we begin to take our ordinary lives and our ordinary choices in our ordinary days and align those with the will of God, we can become the extensions of God's grace, agents of God's redemption, to change other people's stories, to meet them in the midst of the abyss, to let them know they're not alone and that there's hope. What would that look like for you or for me? You know, it, it's, it's easy, when, especially when we're hurting, to just kind of collapse in on ourselves. But, but what if, like Ruth, who was hurting as well, but she still gave herself for Naomi, who was hurting even more. And because of that, they both found redemption. What, what would that look like in our lives? What would it look like to be Boaz, who, who comes alongside of the people in need and, and gives generously, in fact, aligns our life with them, encompasses their life with our own so that they might also become uh, or find redemption. What would it look like for us to embody God's character? I invite you to think about that. Maybe look through the book of Ruth again. Say, where could we do just that? Or the image of that? And what God might do with that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your great grace, for inviting us into your story. And I pray, Lord, that you would now use your story in our lives to change our own stories and our trajectories, Lord, and, and therefore to change the lives of the people around us simply by being present and by being gracious and by embodying your character. Pray it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this week and, and for this book. I, I pray that God's blessing would be upon you as you seek to live his will in your day-to-day -day ordinary existences. May God go with you. Amen. See you next time.